Welcome everybody, uh, my name is Mark Gardner and uh, this afternoon's session or today's session of the, uh, the Global Health Compound Design Meeting is going to be um, dedicated to NIME. I'm very grateful to Greg Landrum from NIME and to Ben Perry from DNDI who are going to take us through an introduction to NIME and uh, NIME use case respectively and then um, if there's a bit of time I will also take you through a NIME use case as well. Um, so that's the agenda for today. I just want to highlight uh, the agenda for the next meeting of this, which will be on a Tuesday, Tuesday the 24th of May, and a little bit earlier to accommodate um, the uh, time zone differences, because um, that will be Paul Willis from MMV and Matt Todd from the University of Sydney. Uh, and they're the, um, the focus, this will be the, the a first for us. This will be a discussion of a malaria project. Uh, it's the open source malaria project where MMV have um, put the, uh, the chemical matter into the public domain. And uh, really we want the focus there to be on the science of that project. Um, so we want audience participation in terms of um, ideas and contributions. Um, possibly during the meeting, possibly after the meeting. So I think that'll be a lot of fun. Um, we're turning our attention back to this meeting. So we're going to focus on NIME, an uh, incredibly uh, valuable tool. Um, all the more valuable to me since I left uh, Pharma's Pharma and didn't have access to uh, more expensive uh, um, tools. So uh, we've got a poll running, which I think most of you have voted on, so it seems that the majority, 60%, are aware of NIME, but not a user, uh, small amounts of people who've used it a bit. Um, so, excellent. I'm going to uh, change presenter to Greg, uh, who will kick off. Okay. What I'm going to do, and I'll try to keep this short, is I'm just going to do a very high-level overview of what NIME is and what the NIME analytics platform is um, to motivate and to explain a little bit how I think about it and to motivate what's coming so that the use cases that follow. I wanted to keep it short so I can leave time for the use cases because those are, I think, at least as important as this overview. Uh, oh, let's see. Okay. Um, so I'll start with a bit of motivation. We're talking about real-world data analysis here on the drug discovery side, and what that normally means is we're going to have to deal with a lot of heterogeneous data. Um, so different data about different types of things um, coming in from multiple sources. So multiple databases or input files or a combination of input files and databases, web services, etc. This combination of heterogeneous data from different sources is something that we call data blending. So we're combining data from multiple sources together. Once we have all of that, we have a series of very complex questions generally to ask about the data. We're not asking simple things. In order to answer those questions, and really in order to be able to ask the questions, we need the appropriate tools. And so this is really about those tools or ways of combining the tools, the rest of this. The problem that we face is we don't have one of these tools um, for working with our data. And I'm sorry. Um, this is a very useful Tool. For those of you who recognize, this is a wrench for assembling IKEA furniture. Um, with this wrench and the appropriate fasteners, so fasteners that look like what, what's shown here, um, you can build very complex pieces of furniture because they have been designed, the whole system is designed to allow this very simple assembly style. So if all of your problems, all of your assembly problems are using the same type of data, or the same type of attachment, then this wrench is the only thing you need and everything is easy. So you can do really complex stuff if you get to control the entire process. Sometimes even for IKEA, they need to get a little bit more fancy, and so they need to include multiple attachment points. So again, the analogy to pharma, this is different kinds of data, the, the attachments here. But again, and in their world, things are relatively simple. These things are standardized, so there's a small number of tools. So you still get the magic IKEA tool for this, but then they will suggest that you use two standard other tools, screwdrivers in this case, to assemble your piece of furniture. And they can give you this one special tool and say use these two standard other things without worrying that you're going to have the wrong brand of screwdriver or the wrong version. Right? They know things will work together because, again, it's standardized. So, once again, if you have sufficient control over the environment, things are pretty simple. In 
life sciences, drug discovery, we tend to need a much broader assortment of tools. Right? We're not going to have just one thing. Um, and if we're really, really lucky, we'll have those tools very well organized and nicely set out so we can find what we need and bring it to bear. In my experience, most of the time, things look a little bit more like this. And so we have a broad assortment of things, but they're really messy and we have to dig around for a little bit to find the right thing. So rural data analysis, we have this heterogeneous data that's coming from multiple sources. We have a variety of complex questions that we want to ask. We need to use a collection of tools to answer those questions, right? There's no magic, aka a wrench, that allows us to solve a life science um, data problem. So this using a collection of tools is what we call tool blending. So we have the data blending, multiple data from heterogeneous data from different sources, and then the tool blending using a collection of tools to address that data. Most of, one very important thing is we don't want to spend all of our time looking for the tools or reformatting data that will to allow us to move between them. Right? We, we need to bring tools to bear. We'd like to be productive and have the moving the data from one tool to another be simple and as low impedance as possible. And this is really where the Nine Analytics platform comes in. So let me provide a high level overview of that. First, what and who we are. Nine is a company. Um, it was founded in 2008. We have offices in Zurich, Constance, Berlin, and San Francisco. About 20 employees these days. Um, and we maintain the open source analytics platform. That's what I'm going to spend the rest of the presentation talking about. The analytics platform, everything I'll show you today, is open source. So it's freely available from our website. You can work with it. Um, you can get access to the source code if you want to make changes to it, and there's nothing that we can do to take that right away from you, so it's truly open and available. Um, there are also a set of commercial extensions based on top of this that I can talk about another time if people are interested. I won't spend time on those today, but this is where the, the commercial extensions are where the revenue for the company is generated, and those support the open access piece or the open source piece. Um, for those of you who haven't seen it, this is a screenshot of the analytics platform. In the middle, you have the workbench. Um, on the left-hand side, you have the toolbox. This is searchable, so you can find all the tools in there. The general idea is you construct a visual workflow made up of a series of nodes. This shows a node at the top. Um, it has an, an input, and the node can have one or more inputs, and then a number of outputs. The node operates on data. It gets a table of data that comes in. It performs an operation on that, and it provides one or more tables of data on the output side that can then be passed on to other nodes. These collections of nodes are combined, um, and we call those workflows. For building those workflows, NIME, the analytics platform out of the box, contains more than a 1,000 different kinds of nodes. Um, we tend to think about them in broad groups. We have nodes for accessing data. This is from reading from files or from databases or web services. We have nodes for transforming data, so lots of reads in, doing things like rearranging columns, filtering data out. Um, we have nodes for doing analysis and data mining. This is one of the areas where NIME really shines. We have a lot of um, expertise in-house and a lot of capabilities for doing uh, machine learning and for doing classic data mining operations. Um, there's a variety of different pieces for visualization and then there's some things for doing reporting, uh, including some fairly sophisticated PDF for Excel-based reporting um, based on some other open source tools. One of the things I want to emphasize, there's a lot built in, and I, I hit on this thousand native nodes um, that are part of the package, but some of those nodes include things that are shown here. Um, they include linkages out to tools like R. So we know we can't do everything, and we provide a lot of openings or, or ability to access other programming languages, things like R or Python, standard things used in data analysis, and to integrate those into your NIME workflow so you can combine those external tools together with the things that are built in. So again, making this tool blending very straightforward. In terms of adoption, um, it's always difficult to say with an open source project really how many people are using it. We know we get about 2 million downloads per year. Um, that corresponds to probably about 50,000 individuals and 3,000 organizations. I'll say some more about the community projects in a bit. Um, and on the commercial side, there's about 75 organizations that are licensing software from us and as well and an additional about 1,500 people. So there is business, there are people paying for the software, but there's a huge number of people who are just using it. Um, 
we support a large number of application areas, right? I'm, I'm the VP for Life Sciences, so that's what I'll be talking about today is the pharma stuff, um, but we also have uh, customers in the manufacturing space or in finance, retail, customer intelligence, et cetera. Um, so this slide may have some logos from some of the people we have worked with or who are we are still working with, and you can see it's a broad assortment from big pharma um, to uh, companies like GE or Bosch. Um, on the manufacturing side. We have had some external recognition, um, which is important, we find, for getting into some of these large organizations. So Gartner flagged this up as a cool vendor back in 2010. And since 2014, we've been on their um, roadmap for, on their magic quadrant, sorry, uh, for advanced analytics and doing quite well on that. So you see we're up in the same area of that roadmap as IBM and SAS, which for a 20% company is pretty good, we think. Quite proud of that. Nine is open source. You can just get it from Nine.com. Um, you can go, click, download the software, and start using it. Uh, we have a bunch of learning information online. Um, so from Nine.com, the Learning Hub has a link to uh, some of the books that we have, as well as a bunch of case studies uh, on the website. And some we're starting to put up a series of YouTube videos with tutorials. Uh, the Beginner's Guide is a great book for getting started with the software and is a very active community that's active on the forum to help. So on that community, this is essential for any open source project that we have an active group of people um, using it and helping each other. There is an active community on the forum, so you can see that. That's a great place to ask questions, have them answered by other users as well as people from within Nine. Um, they get a sense of the size. We had uh, our user group meeting, which we call a summit, um, in Berlin this year, about a month ago, and 250 people show up for that. Um, so that was for us a great thing, have 250 kind of fanatic NIME users show up and talk about what they're doing with the software and share experiences with each other. One thing I want to highlight, it's an open source tool, but it's also an open platform. And this allows us to work with some of our technology partners who provide and support nodes for their software that's normally commercial. Um, so some of this includes on the chemistry, cheminformatics side, companies like Schrodinger, Chemaxon, CCG, and Crescent. All of these companies have nine nodes, a collection of nine nodes that they provide sitting on top of their software that make it easier to use from within nine itself. Um, we also have partners on the community side, so we encourage the people in the community to produce sets of nodes and to share them with each other. And we provide a community site for doing that. And then for community extensions, groups of nodes that reach a particular standard of quality, um, and we have some tests that we apply to check that. For those, we, we promote them to the trusted community level, and at which point they become extremely easy to install within nine that are basically the same, treated the same way as our internally developed nodes. This is an example of some of the community contributions. These are the ones that are quite relevant to drug discovery. Um, the left-hand side, we have the chemistry uh, tools. These are includes um, nodes that were contributed primarily by Novartis, so those are the RDKit nodes. Um, Vernalis is a um, biotech in the UK. Uh, Earl Wood is, is Lilly. Uh, and then we have things from the EBI and a number of other organizations. And then on the bioinformatics side, there's some great software in there for high content screening, uh, as well as a couple of different NGS packages, software for dealing with um, lab informatics systems as well, OpenMS and OpenDIS. And then on the image processing side, for people doing things, want to get more detailed in the standard HCS analysis, Nine is a very rich toolkit connected to this. Again, there's a bunch of additional software in there. I just wanted to flag up a few of the community contributions. You're going to hear more in the next two presentations about real use cases. This is just an overview of some of the stuff that I'm aware of people are doing with it. Um, there's a standard kind of QSAR approach of building, validating, applying predictive models, um, doing virtual screening, uh, doing chemistry experiment planning, so designing syntheses. Um, doing for enumeration of libraries and, and figuring out which components you actually want to make. And I already mentioned along the way, both NGS data analysis and high content screening data analysis. So to wrap up, um, 
the motivation here, we want to be able to work with and organize a bunch of different data types coming from multiple sources. We have a very diverse problem space that there's never going to be one tool that allows us to do everything. So we need to be able to combine multiple tools together, blend those to be able to work with them um, in an efficient manner. And the Nine Analytics platform supports both the data blending and the tool blending that we need to do this kind of real work data, real world data analysis in the drug discovery space. Finally, I'd like to thank you for listening and take any questions. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Greg. Uh, Chris, do you want to ask your question? Thinking about, the, from what I understand, Nine requires Java, and this is not pre-installed on any major platforms now. Uh, and, and in particular, every time I update it, it tries to um, set my home page to Yahoo. Uh, so I get a little bit irritated with it. Uh, added to which, it's not on mobile devices. And I just wonder, is this something that might be a concern in the future? So the analytics platform itself includes a Java runtime environment, so you don't need to have Java installed when you install Nine. Um, and you don't end up with it doing any of the evil stuff that Oracle's installer does to you. Um, it does not work on a mobile device, that's true. Um, one of the things that we are looking at is to enable uh, using the analytics platform itself in a browser, which would solve both of these problems. Um, that is a longer term project for us. It's rather a massive amount of work and it's something that's on our roadmap, but we don't really have a um, concrete delivery date for that yet. Okay, thanks. Great, thank you. And uh, Anand, do you have a question? Okay, that we can just about hear you, but it's not very good. Let me ask you a question because you've you've been good enough to type it. Um, so nodes from Vanalis, Indigo, etc., are open source or commercial? Those are all open source. Everything that I call out on the community contributions are open source. Excellent, thank you. Okay, does anybody else have any questions? I can't see anything at the moment. Okay, that's fantastic. Thank you very much, Greg. That's a great introduction. Um, so if you do have more questions, feel free just to type them in. Um, and uh, at the end of each section, we'll, um, you know, if you want to uh, raise your hand and ask a question, that's, uh, that's good as well. Um, so we're going to move over now to um, Ben Perry from DNDI. So, Ben, hopefully you can share your screen now. Excellent. Okay, I hope you can all hear me. Yep, that's good. Um, Thanks. I'm, I'm going to give uh, a small example as to what NIME can actually be used to do from a drug discovery perspective, and there are obviously a vast number of things that could be used. I've picked for some something that I think is interesting, but maybe not too complex to, to explain. I'm just using a couple of slides here uh, to show, or to, I guess, to, to give a background as to why we're doing this. This is the idea of using principal component analysis uh, displays, so chemical space displays, to show uh, diversity across a, a number of molecules. So this is something that we use almost daily in the NDI for the uh, Drug Discovery Booster project. So for those of you who aren't aware of the Drug Discovery Booster, this is basically a virtual screening uh, initiative. It's a collaboration that involves um, five pharma companies plus the NDI plus the Institute Pasteur in Korea as a screening center. Uh, and we run uh, virtual screening at all five of those pharma companies on the same targets. Uh, and those companies then come back with the results from the virtual screening of those hits, which we then look at and combine into large data sets. And we do this in such a way that the individual companies do not see any of each other's molecules, but we see the full set. There's a lot of confidentiality and a lot of legal work that has to go on behind the scenes to allow us to do this because of the confidential nature of, uh, of these libraries. So when we're talking about the results that come out of this, we can't show any chemical structures, neither externally nor to, within, within the group. So we tend to use principal component analysis space and chemical space to, to talk about our results. Um, and these are the sorts of displays, and I'm using Data Warrior here, um, that we uh, 
that, that we show on, on a daily basis when we're talking about our results. So the idea that we have, a, in this case, a three-dimensional chemical space represented by that gray box, and each small molecule is represented by a different point, and their proximity in chemical space is uh, indicative of similarity, and that similarity can be based on uh, physical chemical properties or, or fragments uh, or fingerprints. Um, and there are lots of different ways of doing that. It's a nice way of showing, I guess, diversity here. We're showing, for example, the results from one of our in silico screens, and you see that different companies, which are rep represented by the different colors, provide uh, different molecules. So this is a way of showing the data package that we're seeing in, spa in, a, in a chemical space environment um, without actually revealing structures. It's really a nice way of being able to look within the data set for similarity within groups of molecules. You see little clusters. Uh, how well are you covering the chemical space, for example? You can see in this particular instance that the chemical space box is quite heavily populated in the top right, but not too populated in the bottom left. So what I, I, I'm going to show now is how we use NIME to actually generate this, this space based on having an input of molecules. So I'm uh, hoping you can see this. This is the, the this is the workbench that, uh, that that's set up in Nime, and this is a workflow that I've written to use as a, 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 as a demonstration. And I'm going to walk you through how this is built up and how it actually processes um, the, the the data to generate principal a principal component space for a set of molecules. So I'm going to start here over on the left in this blue square, and this is what I would consider to be the, uh, the, the, the data access uh, area. So we're going to read in two distinct SD files. Um, we're going to mark each of those distinct SD files as uh, with two separate values so we can, we can identify which compounds have come from which SD file, and we're going, then we're going to merge them. Once they're merged, we're going to then pass them through a series of, um, a, a, of uh, analysis, a, a series of processes each one of these yellow boxes representing those processes in order to generate the principal component space. So I'm just going to show how we would do this first step in NIME. So you have a, an SD reader, it's a standard uh, node that exists in NIME, and once it's on your, on your desktop and you find it from pulling it up from here in, into the, uh, onto the space, I'll use this one. If you double click it, it opens up a, 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 a tab that allows you to input a file. So for example, I've got files on my desktop. I'm going to put an SD file here, which is used for the demo, and I'm going to pull it into, in, in, into the um, on, onto, onto the workspace and in, in, into, into this reader. Um, what you'll see is if I scan that file within this reader, you'll see that there are uh, three different columns, and I'm not counting the, 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 the structure column. So there's the structure column, there's an ID column. Um, there is a, a source column which tells me which company it's come from, and there's also uh, an IC50 column, and it's in micromolar. And you'll see right now that this node is now primed. It has a yellow dot, meaning that it's ready to read, and if I actually go up here and press play, it'll read it, and it comes out in green, which means it's now read the SD file. And if I want to look at that file, I can right-click here and go into Read Molecules, and it'll show me, as you can see here, the SD file. You can see that there's a series of columns and a structure. So, as you'd say, as you would see if you were looking at an SD file in, say, Data Warrior or in Spotfire or in Excel. And now we can do the same thing down here and put in the other um, the other file. Do exactly the same thing. It's all ready to go. And now. This, these are both, both these files are now ready to be read into uh, a constant value column. So this is now another tool that is going to add a new column to that data set. So it's creating a new column. The column is going to be called iteration, and I'm going to assign the first lot or the top row uh, the value first iteration in there, and the second row is going to be the same thing, but it's going to be given a different value. And then I can use a concatenate node to bring those two things together. So if I click here and press play, it runs both of those, and now if I look at the output, what I see is exactly the same thing, but it's two files, and I've got a new column where everything's merged, and you can see that I've got first iteration for the first lot, and then it gradually comes down to second iteration. So now I've got a set of around about, uh, in this case, 700 molecules that have come from two different SD files, and I've merged them into one. And obviously, once this thing is uh, is built up as a, as, a, as a workflow, you don't have to construct it each time. You can go in and just change the SD files that go in at the beginning, and it will be able to run. And I can connect this now up to uh, this green area, which is where I'm going to start the, the, to, to, to create the, the, the principal component analysis space. And this is where we're using the chemoinformatics tools that Greg alluded to earlier. I'm using RDKit, 
So this is the, some of the Novartis uh, tool space. So I'm going to run my SD file into a, a, the RD kit, and it's going to transform the, uh, the structural information from an SD type to an RD kit type. It's just a, a, a transformation that allows the RD kit nodes to be able to operate uh, on the data set. Once that's done, I'm going to run an RD kit descriptor calculation. So this is a, a node that is generated by RD kit that allows us to, to run a whole bunch of different physical chemical property analyses uh, on, our, on our data set. So we can select which ones we want. At the moment, I'm selecting pretty much everything. So we've got S log P, and molecular refractivity, polar surface area, molecular weight, number of atoms, number of bonds, and the list goes on and on. So it's, it's quite a large data set and always coming down to some relatively uh, less common physical chemical properties that are run here. And if we want to, to, again, just hit play up here, it runs that process. And what I'll now see coming out at the end is, if I click on here, again, the same data set, but now I've got a whole, a whole bunch of different properties that I calculated. So this is quite a large data set now. In fact, if I hover over the, the exit from any of the nodes, it'll tell me that I've now got 123 columns and 670 rows. So I'm going to take those properties that I've just calculated, and it's, say, probably about 110 properties, and I'm going to run them through a principal component analysis. So that principal component analysis will, can, will take that data set of 110 different physical chemical properties, and it will condense them down to a smaller number of dimensions. And I can dictate the number of dimensions that, that's going to, that, 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 that I'm targeting with this PCA node. So if I open this up, here I can tell the, the, the program exactly which of those properties I want to use. So for example, I'm using all of the physical chemical, all of the properties I've just calculated, but I'm not using, for example, the IC50, which is also an input in the SD file. So I can choose what goes in. And then from a PCA uh, point of view, I can either choose to reduce it to a set number of dimensions. So I'm going to choose to do that. I'm going to reduce it to four dimensions. Or if I want to retain more information with the PCA, I can say, well, I want to condense this down to the minimum number of, 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 of dimensions that I can use. Whilst, whilst, return, whilst preserving the full information. I'm choosing to do that and just condense this down to four dimensions. And once I've done that, I'm going to rename some of the columns because, uh, again, this is just a standard uh, process that you can run in NIME, so I can just change the, the, the column name from, for example, PCA dimension zero and PCA dimension one. I'm gonna put a little P in front of each of them to indicate that it comes from a property space. And then down here in the orange section, I've got exactly the same sort of process, but here, instead of running a PCA uh, on properties, I'm doing this on fingerprints. Um, so again, this is, uses RD kits fingerprint analysis. So I open this up and I have a choice of different fingerprints that I can create, Morgan fingerprints or uh, Max or a whole, whole variety. And I can also modify, for example, using the, the Morgan, I can modify the number of bits, I can modify the radius. I'm using basically the standard default setting here. I calculate that fingerprint for those uh, molecules, and I can then run it through an expander, which allows me to take that fingerprint, which is effectively a 1024-digit uh, single uh, binary um, number, and convert it into 1024 different columns, each one being represented by a single uh, binary digit. And now that I've got that, I've effectively got another set of data that I can run through a principal component analysis. This time, instead of taking the property space, I'm going to take those 1,024 different fingerprint readouts, and I'm going to condense those down to give me a, set, a, a slightly different uh, principal component analysis based entirely on the fingerprints. Um, there's a couple of manipulations that I run here just to make that a little bit more successful, which is where I eliminate low variance, so columns, for example, that don't uh, have much have, have less than two percent variance uh, across the data set, and then I normalize those to run into the PCA in order to give it a, a, a full view. And you see it's running the say, principal component analysis relatively quickly, three or four seconds to do that on 700 molecules and a, and a 1024 bit fingerprint. And I can rename those in the same way that I did previously. And just to show, actually, this is because I'm going to transfer into Data Warrior in a second, and there's a really neat part of Data Warrior that I thought I'd like to, to, to pick up. I'm going to use this simple math conversion formula here. What I'm looking at is I'm going to take the IC50 value that I had in there originally, which is in micromolar, and I'm going to convert it into nanomolar. So I'm going to create a new column, simple transformation. This can be done in Data Warrior as well, but I'm just using this to show how one would do it in NIME. 
and I'm going to create a new column that is the IC50 in Nanomola. And then at the end, I've now got a huge data set that has thousands of columns. I'm going to get rid of some of them. I'm only going to retain the columns that I want to keep. So here, this is a column filter that allows me to keep the columns that I want. So the activities, the compound ID, and certain of the molecular descriptors, but not all of them. I'm going to keep my PCA dimensions. As you can see, I can have four PCA dimensions that I generated using physical chemical space and four that I generated using fingerprint space. And I'm going to run that. And now I'm going to save that as a new SD file. So I'm just going to drag a new SD writer onto the workspace, file it up. I'm going to create a destination. So I'm going to use the same space that I use here. I'm going to call it output file one. There we go. And I'm going to run that. And so now I've saved that as a new SD file. Um, obviously, I've already run this process using this input, and I've got that SD file already open here in Data Warrior. So this is the, this is the exact uh, data, data, data file that we just opened, but visualized in Data Warrior. You can see here, and I've hidden the structures because obviously these are proprietary structures. Um, you can see that we've got the molecular weight, the various, uh, some of the, of the physical chemical properties we calculated, fractions CSP3, uh, the iteration, whether it came from a first iteration or second iteration of screening, so those are the two tags that I put in earlier. I've got my IC50, both in nanomolar and micromolar. This was the original input, and I've also got the conversion here, compound IDs. And you can see that I've got my PCA space, which are numbers that are effectively, for want of a better word, meaningless, but are representative of, in this case, either the fingerprint or the physical chemical properties of that particular molecule relative to each other. So now that I've got that data set, what I can do is using Data Warrior's three-dimensional display, I can choose to have my three dimensions that are showing me here as being those PCA dimensions. So you can see I've got um, fingerprint PCA dimension two and fingerprint PCA dimension three. I could change those if I wanted and go to you know, fingerprint PCA dimension zero and it makes a slight modification. And I've got a physical chemical PCA dimension here on, on the y-axis. And so looking at this, what I'm showing is this data set. As you can remember, I, I mentioned earlier that this is we use this for analyzing screening iterations that have gone through um, or virtual screening iterations that have come from pharmaceutical companies. And part of the booster project, what we do, and the reason that we do this with a number of partners, is we show a single molecule, which would be our initial hit. They go away and they each run their um, in silico screening come back to us with, let's say, 50 to 100 compounds, which we then test. Uh, we test them, we find the compound, and we then feed that back into the process because, say, for example, the most interesting compound comes from, let's say, Takeda, who are one of our partners. That small molecule might actually be quite different to the original hit, and although Takeda know what it looks like, the other four companies don't. And part of the booster process shows that we are then allowed to take that best hit, and we're then allowed to reveal that structure to the other remaining members of the part, uh, of, of the consortium. And if they repeat the in silico screening, what they might find is a completely different data set. And the idea is we run iterative cycles to, 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 to push down the potency, push down the activity, and, and really mine out the company's libraries in, 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 in iterations. What I'm showing you here in blue, these are the PCA dimensions of um, the original first set of compounds provided by our uh, screening set by our, our screening partners or by our in silico screening partners. So around about 300 compounds uh, that came from the first iteration. And what we what we show here, this molecule in green, is the compound that we found to be the most interesting when we ran that screen. So it's the compound that's the most potent that came out of this data set. And when we feed that back into our, uh, our set, what we hope to see from our second iteration is enrichment around that space, which is kind of what we see here when we open it back out in, in red. And so you can see that by using this sort of space, we can show, without having to show any structures, we can see how well our, um, our particular uh, screening process is, is evolving and whether we're really focusing in. And we, we can do things, for example, looking at hotspots. So for example, if I choose to now color this based on potency, and I'll switch that into a different color. What we can see is that there are sort of really key areas where there's, there are more actives, reds here being the actives and blues being inactives, and we can see that we start to see hot spots, uh, and we can identify the real areas of interest. So for example, in here and in here. So 
I guess what, what we're trying to show here is that this use of PCA space and this use of chemical space is uh, a really nice way of being able to show data sets of chemical structures and show similarity of chemical structures without ever having to show any, uh, any chemical structures themselves, which is really useful for our process. And I'm sure that people have seen this idea of using PCA space to, 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 to PC or PCA um, analysis to show chemical space uh, in, in a number of other guises. But what I'd like to show here and what I hope to I, I've been able to show is quite how simple it is to set that up and run that with NIME. Now, obviously, this is a workflow that I've written myself. I've, I wouldn't, certainly wouldn't consider myself a power user of NIME or an expert user. I've written a few scripts. Uh, once that you, I'm completely self-taught, so I, I've been really helped a lot by, as Greg mentioned, a fantastic um, uh, user base in the forums that exist there. Basically, everything I, I, I showed earlier is something that I've learned by typing uh, Nine. how do I do PCA into Google? And the first hits come up and there's usually fantastic examples and, and, and available scripts that are already written. What I've mentioned to Mark is the particular script that I've shown earlier and, and, and run you through uh, is something that I can export and make available to everyone who wants to use it. So it's just a case of downloading Nine, opening up that workspace and you have access exactly to the process that I've just shown you here. In fact, it looked like this. And just by swapping out the SD files you have in this position, you should be able to just press play and you'll get a new SD file that has all of those um, parameters uh, uh, calculated. And hopefully you'll be able to see how maybe you can modify those and go about playing with the, 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 the tool yourself by modifying how you run the PCA, by modifying which calculators you use, which, by modifying which fingerprints you use. So I think with that, I'm not sure if there are any questions. Yes, yes, we are going yes, to do uh, that. So, yeah, sorry, go ahead. So, yeah, so so the the workflow that I ran you through, I can uh, I, I I will save and share. It comes out as a zip file. It's really easy to import. It's really simple to import it into into Nine. And I've also written because I wasn't sure whether using a live demo was going to work. So I've also written a whole slide set that goes through exactly what I went through step by step that shows exactly how to manipulate each of those nodes and what each node does, which you can use as a, as, as a user guide. And it's very, I think it's, it's, a, it's, it's a nice, it's an interesting way of starting to, to, to learn how to use NIME. It's, 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 it's not, the, not the most straightforward um, process. You know, there are some really, really neat things that you can do with NIME that only use three nodes. You know, it's a, an, an input, an output, and a single manipulation in the middle. And it's just, once you know how to use it, it's much, much faster than trying to do it by uh, uh, other methods. So for example, you know, particularly for generating just physical chemical properties on a whole bunch of molecules. Now, I'm not saying it's the only way of doing it, but it, it's, it, it's, it's, a, it's a very versatile and, and quick way of doing it. I'm going to share this particular um, workflow, but I'm also available to, 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 to speak with people on a one-on-one -on -one basis or to, 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 to email if there are any questions and how to go about using it as well. Thanks. Fantastic. Thank you. And um, Sivaraman, you had a question? Ah, wait a minute. I just need to unmute you. There you go. Oh, thank you. Um, are there any other example workflows available? What would be a good source for kind of looking through other workflows like the one that you have described here, is that part of NIME or is there a different source that, that's available that's open source? Thank you. I, I can speak from my experience. I'm not sure if, if Mark or Greg want to, want to chime in. There are hundreds and hundreds of, of examples that are, are available usually through the NIME forums because it's, an, because it's open source and it's got such a fantastically active community. Uh, it, it's re I usually find it very easy to find what I'm looking for, and oftentimes people will openly share their scripts for you to download and and and, and run. Um, so, in fact, a lot of a lot of the the, the, the work I do with Nime is is basically built from taking other people's ideas and and using those to, to to build up. So, for example, if you wanted to run a pains analysis, for example, there's a really fantastic uh, readily available pains. Uh, workflow that I think was put together by by the guys at Monash, um, which I, I which which is available. It's just a case of searching on, for example, Google and typing Nime Pains Analysis or Nime PCA Analysis, and, and you'll 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 be directed to it quite quite quickly. Thank you so much. Very helpful. That's a great question. Thank you. 
And um, there's a couple of other questions on text here. Um, Justin Gibbons has asked, does Data Warrior come with NIME? Uh, <laughs> Data Warrior is freely available from openmolecules.org, I believe is the address. It's, uh, it, again, I, I personally find it a great companion to, to, to NIME. As Mark alluded to earlier, there are very expensive uh, tools available that do very similar work to NIME and very similar work to Data Warrior and uh, NIME and Data Warrior are free versions that effectively uh, mirror those uh, almost perfectly. So it's, it, it's for someone on a reduced budget, Data Warrior and NIME as a combination is fantastic. Both are available I say, for, for free and very easy to access. You have to convert, it is, is it openmolecules.org? Yes, I'm, open I'm going to. Org. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it, Data Warrior is also, it's an open source thing like NIME, so it's not just free, you also have access to the code, which is quite useful. Fantastic, thank you. And uh, Grace asked, are the demos available on NIME? Did you want to say anything about the um, NIME forums and um, that those, you know, availability of other pro, uh, workflows, Greg? Um, no, I mean, I think Ben already covered it quite nicely. It's, there's, the forums are a great place to ask if you have questions. People tend to be very good about answering them and pointing you to things that have been posted publicly. Um, we also monitor the forums, and there's a number of workflows that we host on, a, on an example server that people can download. But really, the easiest way to find them is either Google or just posting on the forums and seeing what comes back. Fantastic, thank you. And and Justin's asked a follow-up question. Um, can Data Warrior be integrated into the NIME node workflow though? I think we heard last month actually from Isabel um, at Actelian that um, they do have plans to put some, well, I don't know whether it's them or you, but uh, that there are plans to put some Data Warrior nodes together for NIME. Do, do you know anything about that, Greg? Do you want to expand on that? I, I've talked to them a couple of times about it. Um, it would be something that the Actelion guys need to do, um, and we're happy to help them. And you know, I've talked to my desk a number of times, and we'll see. It's just a matter of them finding the time to do it. Okay, fantastic. So I will um, finish off briefly with uh, some work. Uh, we've done, uh, well, I should say we've done, obviously <laughs> very much building on what others have done. Um, so let me start, hopefully I'm showing my screen now. If uh, Ben or Greg could share it, if not, that would be great. Um, so just to show you actually, because a couple of people have asked, you know, where, where to go to get information. There's lots of potential places to go to get information. This is um, one of them. And uh, yeah, George uh, Papadatos, I'm going to talk about an example of using um, Kemble actually through NIME. And George has also commented that there are lots of examples of workflows um, on uh, NIME. The, I've, I've taken you to this um, MMV web page because um, we and AMG have been doing some work uh, in putting some guides together for some of the free tools that are out there. And also, as you may know, um, advertise these talks through this site. So it's on the R&D, um, uh, it's under the R&D menu option here, computational chemistry. So uh, there are links to um, allow you to register for upcoming meetings. This is the one for this meeting, obviously. And then a bit further down, um, there are, uh, there's information on some uh, guides that use um, some of these tools. Uh, so um, previously, you may have seen presentations on uh, PK tool. Um, this is uh, the second one is mostly on uh, using Data Warrior. Um, this one is actually uh, we haven't spoken about this one um, at one of these meetings, but this is on using Yasara to look at protein ligand interactions, um, so crystal structures and the like. And the one I'm going to talk about is um, on uh, what we've called Know Your Molecule, um, and so that uh, starts with a NIME workflow. So actually, if you click on this, um, you end up getting through to a PDF document uh, which explains this workflow and uh, gives a little bit of background to um, why 
we put the workflow together, which is essentially the the work the the use use case is uh, aimed at being relatively early on in a project where you might have some HTS hits, and you are interested in um, making decisions about which series to invest in. Um, and one of the things that you might well want to know, obviously, apart from the structure um, and the properties and the, the potencies in in your assays, are uh, is, is what other pharmacology have compounds like that got? And um, Kemble is a great place to go and ask that kind of question. And um, this is demonstrating that uh, that that workflow was used in this um, paper uh, for, uh, relate in, in malaria. Um, and, and George, who's on the line, is, is one of the co-authors on here. Um, and uh, this is uh, a, a brief introduction to Kemble um, and Nime and Data Warrior. So some of the things that we've heard about and all those three things are used in this workflow. So I'm going to switch over to the workflow now. And this basically is, um, you know, again, we've talked about using other people's workflows and using those as a basis for your own. This is very much use that. So it's basically taking a lot of the um, hard work that's been done uh, largely by the EBI group. And, you know, maybe uh, George will want to comment at the end. Um, there's two uh, key nodes um, for connecting to Kemble here. One allows a structure-based search. That's the Kemble DB connector input here. And then the second one is the biology data lookup here. So what this workflow does is um, you input a molecule here. Um, this can be a molecule where you're looking for similarity to compounds um, that might be in uh, Kemble, or it can be a substructure. So the idea is this would be your HTS hit or a substructure of your HTS hit. Um, you can sketch it in, or I believe in Marvin, you can actually paste in a smile string and it will convert it to a structure for you. Um, and then uh, this um, node will do either a similarity search for you or a substructure search for you into Kemble. Um, and then the output of that, uh, so I'm not running that search live, but it doesn't take all that long, actually. Um, so the output is a bunch of um, the similar compounds. This is so far without biology. This is just um, compounds, and somewhere in here is a column with uh, similarity in. Um, so if we sort descending, then actually the compound itself, the parent compound, is in Kemble, and then you can see that there are um, variety of other similar compounds. Uh, I've chosen to um, actually compare, uh, calculate a, a similarity between the, uh, the the input compound and this these output compounds in uh, the Morgan algorithm. Um, this is using uh, the uh, RD kit as uh, Ben was, um, because I, I guess I'm just more familiar with the Morgan algorithm and, and comfortable with what its numbers are and the um, you know the sort of medchem relevance of the similarity. But that's uh, it's kind of in some ways a personal choice. It's just another similarity number. And then um, you have a choice at this point in the workflow of uh, essentially just using a similarity cutoff. So that's the simple thing to do. Um, you can uh, you know just apply uh, a, a, a cutoff to the similarity value. Um, so this is one of those um, nodes that uh, uh, Ben talked about. And here we're just saying anything uh, less than 0.1. Actually, that's a very low value. I just put that in really to make sure that it didn't filter anything out um, because I wanted to just capture everything in the output. But um, you know, further on down the line, you could put in uh, a cutoff um, that might be more meaningful and you just keep all the things that were higher than 0 0.5 similar. Um, so I won't change that now, but that one could do. An alternative, um, which would get uh, perhaps more sort of uh, control over the output if you want to, is um, this node, this interactive table. You can actually uh, view the, oh, of course I have to run the, um, run the protocol to get as far through as that. Uh, view the table here um, and so what we can do here is 
this would allow us to say, well, okay, so um, this was my input molecule and uh, I can now pick the compounds that I think are relevant or if, if it was easier, I could pick the compounds that I think are not relevant. So at some point I could start looking down this list. And of course, chemical similarity as calculated by these algorithms, um, it doesn't know about, you You might have some SAR that says, uh, well, I know that you know these dicarbonyl compounds are not gonna be of interest to me. Um, so, you know, I'll eliminate that. Um, but, you know, just because it happens to have a dicarbon, it doesn't mean that it's, um, you know, bottom of the list of similarities. So you can start to cherry pick, uh, you know, maybe some compounds to exclude uh, from the um, similarity, uh, from, from the biology lookup. So um, basically you just change the plumbing here to determine whether or not you use the, uh, the filter uh, which of these two filters you use. Do you then do the uh, the biology data lookup? So this is um, going back to the Kemble database in real time and picking up the uh, the biology. And then um, you can choose to output the whole lot without any further processing. Um, but because in some cases that can be a very large amount of information, and as you may know, um, if we have a quick look here, the output can have an awful lot of different types of um, biological, uh, you know, so you can have percent inhibitions, you can have those response data and a whole lot of other stuff as well. Um, I've chosen now to put some of this um, through some processing to uh, group it in different ways, um, which are explained in the, in the PDF in a bit more detail. So uh, just to take one example, um, this is a set of data of some of the more potent compounds. I think they're more than one micromolar and they are ones where the target is relatively frequent in the output. Um, so as uh, Ben was showing, if you pick up the, the you'd have to um, change this to obviously a, a, an output destination relevant to you. Um, if we pick up that uh, file name, we can take that to uh, Data Warrior and um, open that file. I'll just paste in the destination, and um, essentially this is the this is the output. And now I have um, processed this so that it contains targets that are relatively common in the output. So I'm interested in those targets that are uh, hit most frequently or present most frequently in the Kemble database, and um, then I can look at. Uh, plot of similarity against activity and uh, another thing you can do with data warrior is to split the view by categories so I can split it by um, target name and you can start to see uh, that um, this is the this is the parent compound but you can start to see that some um, some compounds with some similarity to the parent has got activity against other targets, and these are uh, these are some of the targets that are present most frequently in the output. But there are other files in that uh, workflow um, that have uh, activities against uh, targets with less frequency in the in the set of similar compounds. So as we're pretty much at time, um, I'm going to just point you back to the PDF document. Um, which you would get starting from the uh, the data the um, MMV web page. So I will stop talking and just see if there are any last questions from anybody. George, of course, a lot of this from EBI is uh, is based on Kemble. Did you want to say any anything at all? Um, yeah. Hi. Hi there. Hi. Um, just a comment that, um, <clears throat> or maybe two. Um, I, I think the combination of um, the open um, SAR type data from Cambiel with um, the open source and free data processing and data mining by Nine, and then the data, the interactive data analysis with um, Data Warrior. I think it's is the perfect um, combination nowadays for um, drug discovery and computational medicinal chemistry. Um, um, of course, I'm not. I'm not biased. Um, <laughs> and then another another comment would be that um, a lot of examples, a lot of community um, workflows um, are, um, as I said in the nine examples, uh, 
server uh, which is accessible from the nine clients so people wouldn't have to like Google or search the forum um, they are categorized nicely into different categories and folders and people can find there um, several examples that usually um, can build nodes and um, fetch data from can build and then do uh, further analysis and um, plotting for example as another way to access to to find quickly um, already existing workflows. Fantastic. Thank you very much. One thing I meant to say as well is that um, since we put that workflow together, uh, it's also possible to access the Kemble database directly from within Data Warrior. So, in fact, if you go to um, database, search Kemble database, if you have uh, a structure in there, you can do substructure searching or similarity searching. Um, it, it, it's, it, I guess one advantage of using NIME is that you get to do the, uh, the post-processing as well as the lookup, but uh, just to point out that that exists and it's mentioned also in that PDF I showed you. Um, so both of these protocols um, are available and we will provide links to them in the follow-up emails that you'll get. Um, tomorrow, and if, if they're not available tomorrow, I'll make sure that you get a link uh, to them um, next week. Uh, is Nine connected to PubChem as well? Um, Greg, do you know the answer to that? Um, there is a node that uses the Resolver service that PubChem provides, but that's it for the moment. Okay. Um, I talked to, I had a long conversation with, with Evan Bolton about this at the ACS meeting and we will continue that conversation, but at the moment there's no direct connection other than the resolver. Okay, thank you. Can I, can I also add to that that um, um, uh, there is um, Unichem, um, another resource that provides mapping between different um, public repositories and there's no node for um, Unichem, but um, dedicated node, but because um, Unicam provides web services. Uh, people can um, fetch these web services um, from Nine, and it's a way to access um, uh, compounds. I think about 100 million compounds from different repositories, including PubChem. Uh, it doesn't provide um, yet um, chemistry searches, but at least they can do um, exact matches with their compounds across several different sources. Okay, interesting. Fantastic. Thank you very much indeed, everybody. Uh, thank you in particular again to Greg and Ben. Um, so this recording will be available. You'll get a link to it tomorrow. And uh, hopefully in that email as well, we'll also provide links to all the other resources. Um, but if you go to that uh, MMV website, uh, that is also a great um, place to leap off from to all the uh, information about today's meetings and all the others. Thanks a lot for your time and um, hope to see you on Tuesday, May the 24th to talk about uh, Malaria Project and look at some structures. Thanks a lot, everybody. Bye.